So welcome to Street Science um, and welcome to a foggy, cool evening in Nome. Um, Street Science is a public presentation series put on by the University of Alaska Fairbanks Northwest Campus, as well as University of Alaska Fairbanks Alaska Sea Grant. And tonight we've got Suzanne McDermott. She's going to talk to us about the winter travels of the Pacific Cod. So this is something near and dear to all of us in the region. Um, and Su Suzanne McDermott is a fisheries biologist at the NOAA Alaska Fisheries Science Center in, in Seattle. And that's where she is tonight. So thank you. We're, we're all learning this virtual world. And she wanted a poll before she begins. Get ready. So here we go. Hopefully we can get to the first question. This is just to prime the audience. Did you know that the number of Pacific Cod have rapidly increased in the Bering Strait region? And I'm sorry for those, I know there's a couple people on the telephone. I don't know how to make that happen for you to answer those questions, but um, give it a minute and we'll read off the response here. Oop, people are voting. All right, I'm gonna end it and share the results. So everyone should be able to see on your screen. Hopefully that's worked. Suzanne, can you see that? Yes. Okay. Did you know that the number of Pacific Cod have rapidly increased? 64% of the listeners said yes. 36% did not. That's very interesting to me. All right. So with that, we'll have a few more like that for you. But um, take it away, Suzanne McDermott, and tell us about Pacific Cod from the Bering Street region and their winter travels. Okay, well, thank you everyone for taking your time to listen to this. So what I want to do first is acknowledge all the people involved. This is a group effort of many different um, people and uh, institutions. Um, we're working together with Norton Sound Economic Development Corporation and with um, our um, industry partners, and also with Kingfisher Marine Research, um, Julie Nielsen. <clears throat> okay, so now for some reason this is not going forward. Why is this? All right, here we go. And so I also want to acknowledge our cooperative partners. We have um, worked together with the survey charter vessels and crew of the Vester Allen and the Alaska Knight, and we have worked with, I mentioned before, Norton Sound Economic Development Corporation with Don Wade and Riz Jones. But we also worked with the Savunga fishermen and plant personnel, especially um, the crew of the Adeline, Captain Perry Pongawi, and the crew of the Scarlet, Captain Rich Tooley, and Orville, Orville Tooley, the plant manager. Okay, so some background. For those of you that don't know that much about Pacific Cod, they're a very abundant ground fish in the Bering Sea. Um, and they become quite large. <clears throat> they can be up to 100 pounds, um, 80, 90 centimeters large, and um, they like all kinds of habitat. Sand, gravel, and rocks. They're kind of a generalist that way. And in the summer, we find them distributed more solitary, more um, further apart and they feed by themselves, just like large predators do. But in the winter, the cod aggregate in large spawning groups at specific spawning sites. And a lot of times that's when the fishery targets them in the winter. Um, I'm sure that many of you have heard that we have changing ocean conditions where a warming ocean changes the sea ice coverage and temperature in the Northern Bering Sea, as you have experienced in the last couple of years. Um, what that means for a fish like Pacific cod that usually lives in the south, it means they can migrate further north in the winter as well as in the summer. So what I'm showing you here are temperature plots that we collect during our annual uh, bottom trawl survey. Blue is cold and red is warm. And in the summer, usually we used to have this large extent of cold water that comes all the way down in the center of the Bering Sea, and that's what we call the cold pool. It's water that stays cold because of the melting sea ice. 
So you can see in 2010, you have this large cold pool. In 2017, it was still large, but breaking up a little bit. But then look at 2018, there's almost no cold pool. And in 2019, it was only in that northern part. So why is that important? It's important because a lot of fish don't like to be inside this cold pool and they avoid it. So once this cold pool is gone, there's a little bit more area for the fish to go that like uh, warmer water. So also what happened in 2017, 18 and 19 was that adult Pacific cod were recorded in high abundance for the first time in the Northern Bering Sea with the NEMS trial survey. And the most of the high abundance areas of cod occurred close to the St. Lawrence Island area and the Russian border. So here I'm showing you, these are um, snapshots from the bottom trawl survey. And blue means that there's a lot of cod. This is measured in kilogram per hectare. And uh, white means not a lot of cod or the yellow. So you can see that in 2010, the cod was really distributed on the outside of this cold pool and mostly in that southern Bering Sea area. So this border here is what we call the border to the northern Bering Sea versus the southern Bering Sea. And then in 2017, for the first time, we saw this large abundance of cod right up here by St. Lawrence Island and the Russian border. And the same in 2018, even more intense and 2019. So this is kind of a new occurrence and has um, kind of raised flags for scientists that have not seen this before. It has a lot of management implications because Pacific cod is captured, you know, commercially by a commercial fleet and, and we want to know also the impact on the ecosystem. So <clears throat> this is also a picture of the Southern Bering Sea and Northern Bering Sea Pacific cod biomass. So what we have here on the left is million metric tons as um, the abundance. And here, this is by year. And you can see this is the Southern Bering Sea that the biomass goes up and down, but it kind of goes, um, the average is around um, 750 metric tons. And you can see that right now we are at a very low end in the Southern Bering Sea. Whereas in the Northern Bering Sea, the biomass has been going up. And we're currently up 30% from 2017 at 368 metric tons. So this Northern Bering Sea biomass is approaching almost the Southern Bering Sea biomass. <clears throat> so this has posed a lot of research questions. Um, and one of the big ones is what are the basic movement patterns of adult cod between winter spawning and summer feeding grounds? So these fish that we find in the summer in the northern Bering Sea, the question is what is the movement between the northern and the southern Bering Sea cod? Is this the same population or do they <clears throat> form completely separate populations that develop separately? We also want to know is there movement of cod between the U.S. and the Russian border? We know that there is a large fishery, for example, in Russia, right on the other side of that border that might capture a lot of the fish that cross over. <coughs> Another question we had was, can cod stay under the ice in the winter in the northern Bering Sea? We don't really understand um, fish under the ice, especially fish that we historically have never seen under the ice. We don't know if cod can withstand the temperature, if they can move, if they can feed, um, or if the ice would be detrimental to their survival. Then we wanna know if cod can spawn successfully in the Northern Bering Sea. So they're there in the summer, can they maybe stay there in the winter and spawn there and have their own new population develop? And Finally, if cod go south in the winter, do they return to the northern Bering Sea in the following summer? So those are the questions we wanted to answer. Um, and then here is a little bit about population structure. So we have this population in the northern Bering Sea and in the southern Bering Sea, and we kind of want to know to fish from the northern Bering Sea go all the way down south into the Yenemek Pass area to spawn, or do they just stay in that northern area to spawn, or do they maybe go into Russia? And some of this 
has been addressed with genetic studies by um, Ingrid Spies that is at the Alaska Fishery Science Center and we and she has found that some of the northern Bering Sea cod that she looked at are related to the southern Bering Sea cod, which means most likely that population is mixing because they're genetically very similar. Okay, so all these questions um, are questions made by scientists. So what we thought is we, we put a, a hydrophone in the water and find out what maybe we can get some information from the fish themselves. And so, um, we made a recording and Gay hopefully can get this recording up and going because I send it to her. And this is the never before recorded Northern Bering Sea underwater punk rock band that we found. I don't know if you guys can hear it, but the text is Did you hear it? Did you hear it? Now that people tune in. Anyway, it was fascinating. I had no idea. I'm going to go buy myself a hydrophone. Thank you so much. Right. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, so the methods. Look, 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 look. Ah, hang on. Technical difficulty. Whoa, get rid of them. Okay, continue on. Sorry about that. So we decided to use um, satellite tags to release um, with Pacific Cod. And the nice thing about these tags is you put them on the fish and then you program them to pop up at a certain time. And the tags uh, come off the fish and pop up to the surface and download the data they collect to satellite. So you don't ever have to capture the fish to get the data back. <clears throat> In 2019, we went into uh, the St. Lawrence Island area and we released um, 38 Pacific Cod tags. And um, we released them on three different platforms, the Alaska Night, which is here in red, um, the Wester Allen, and uh, we went on local uh, skiffs uh, from the fishing fleet in Savunga. And the, the numbers here are the numbers of tag we release at each of these locations. We also released three stationary tags, one in each um, of the locations indicated here. And those stationary tags will record light, depth, and temperature um, in one place. And we can compare that to all the data recorded on the satellite tags that are on the fish. So we can actually see what the local environment looked like. So one of the things I forgot to mention is the tags we put out record light, depth, and temperature um, for each fish during its entire time on the, uh, in the water. <coughs> so what we did was we um, programmed these tags to pop up at certain intervals. And the reason why we did that is we wanted to kind of have a sequence of them popping up. So when a tag pops up, it talks to a satellite and you know its location right then and there. So if you don't get any of the other data, the depth data and the temperature data, you still get a location. <clears throat> and so we wanted to have that location in, uh, in certain intervals so we could see where the fish are going throughout the year. Okay, so here are some pictures of how we, uh, how we tagged the cod. We decided to capture the fish on the larger vessels. These are the survey vessels with hook and line because that is the most gentle way to catch them. So these guys had a whole bunch of fun fishing. Now once the fish come on board, we are taking different samples from them. We're taking their lengths. We're taking a genetic sample and then we're inserting the tag and you can see it here. You're inserting the tag in the dorsal musculature of the fish. <coughs> And then the fish gets put back in the water with a descender. You can see this here. And what the descender does is it puts the fish down at a certain depth and then releases it. Cod have a swim bladder. And sometimes that swim bladder is inflated and the fish has a hard time swimming back down. So the faster you put that fish back down underwater, the less effect the barotrauma will have on this fish. So we put the fish down to 50 feet and then let 
and then the descenda pops open and the fish swims out. And then this is the stationary tag set up. You can see here there's an anchor and there's a little buoy and here's the tag sitting on that buoy. The tag goes in the water and records data for a whole year. Okay, so then uh, this part is gonna be our trip to Savonga where we deploy tags of researched uh, of charter vessels um, with local halibut fishermen. So what you can see here is the plant in Savunga. Um, that is where the halibut gets delivered and from where all the fishermen, you know, meet and go out on. And then here you can see this is the, this is Paris Hunga and his crew. And this is Richmond and his crew. And those are where the two vessels that we used to release the cod. And here you can see us in the, in the fish plan talking um, about locations where they're fishing and figuring out where to go. And then this is the, the boats we use. So they're all uh, 19 foot lands. And there is no uh, boat dock in Savonga. So what, um, what everyone does is you have to push the boats in in the water. And here you can see they have this little um, area that makes it easier to put the boat back in and out right on the beach. <clears throat> so it turns out that halibut fishermen in Savunga have been catching cod on their long lines for a number of years, but currently they're released back in the water alive after capture. I'm not sure if this year they're actually processing the fish, but when we went out last year, they were not. So this was kind of a perfect um, place to do it. We were capturing the cod, but the fishermen didn't use them, so we could use them uh, to release it back in the water. And here you can see his beautiful cod is captured. And then we had to do everything on this little boat and we, we had a little tub that we put water in so the fish could get water while we were tagging it. And here you can see us tagging the fish. Um, here's a fish with the tag on it. And then here you can see David letting the fish back out into the water. So in two days we released eight Pacific cod with satellite tags and we also tagged 75 cod with conventional tags. And during the same time, we also, um, Dawn Wade was with us from Norton Sound Economic Development Corporation and she tagged halibut for the International Pacific Halibut Commission. Okay, so here are some results. Let's see. <clears throat> so I'm gonna just uh, quickly show you that to date we have recovered 30 of the 38 tags. There's still a few fish out at large that are gonna pop up in August. And then two of the tags have not been heard from. We assume maybe those fish got trapped under the ice and the tags just um, tried to transmit and never got to transmit or something like this. But so far, really nice high success rate. We have very little mortality and uh, most of the tags have worked. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you right now is just the pop-up locations by months doesn't mean that the fish went to this place straight from their release site. It just means that when we got the tags back at this month, that's where they popped up. Okay, so in September, we got a couple tags back. They were still right next to the release sites. In October, a couple of the tags had moved a little north. And then in November, you can see the tags spread out quite a bit. And the pink here is the ice. So you can see the ice started to form a little bit but not too much ice yet, but still quite a few tags were still right around St. Lawrence and one of the tags had moved into the Russian area. Suzanne, this is Gay. Did you want to do the swim distance poll? Yeah, this will be, oh, okay, maybe we can do it now. All right, so maybe what we can do is have our second poll right now before I give you the results. Before you give the results, all of the results. Yep, so here we go, That's everyone, right. get ready to click. And the question is, how far did the best cod traveler swim in your, would you guess? This is the big Pacific cod. How far would you think the best cod traveler swam? Yeah. Okay. 
Come on and vote in there, people. We got almost. Ooh. Okay, I'm going to call it right there. End the poll. Share the results. Very interesting. Everybody's kind of got, nobody goes for that 50 mile stuff, but look at that. 300, 600, 2,500. Everybody's on that. So, okay. Thank you all and take it away, Suzanne. Tell us what happened. Okay, so then the next, um, so in January, the fish had moved south a little bit. So really in January is what happens is the fish are starting to move because the ice is coming in and the Northern Bering Sea area is not gonna, is not open anymore. It is ice covered, almost all of it. And so two of the fish moved into the Russian waters and then three moved into the more Southern Bering Sea area. Okay, I'm stuck here, why is this not going? Hmm. Oh, okay, in February, um, we had a lot of ice. I don't know if you remembered, you had a pretty cold winter last year. And um, so we found several fish right in this area here, which is kind of close to where we know they're spawning, right on the edge here in these canyons. And then here is March, and in March, um, the ice retreated a little bit and you could see that most of the fish were along this um, slope area, which is where we know they have been spawning, have been recorded spawning before. But then look at this guy. So one fish went all the way down to the Gulf. So this is the guy that swam the furthest, which is 1,080 kilometers as a straight line, if you just use the straight line. It probably traveled um, further than that which is about 600 miles. So whoever said 600 miles, that was the answer. <clears throat> and then we got some fish. So this is our spawning kind of um, snapshot. So the fish all pretty much were now in the Southern Bering Sea, except one that was in Russian waters, and then one that went all the way to the Gulf of Alaska. <clears throat> and then we didn't have any recoveries in April or May, but in June, we got two recoveries and that was a little bit surprising. One of the fish went to the uh, Bristol Bay, right here, and the other one went all the way back up north into the Northern Bay Sea. And then in July, we have one last recovery in the Northern Bay Sea. So this is all the recoveries that we had to date. <clears throat> So here, I just want to kind of hone in onto the spawning distribution. Um, so this is a slide from a scientist at our center, Sandy Nidicher, who has recorded uh, Pacific cod spawning um, maturities from observers on commercial vessels. So you can see the, the orange is a fish that were in pre-spawning condition and the red is in spawning condition. And you can see that cod have been observed to spawn all the way down this whole slope area. So this is from several years ago. So there really wasn't any commercial fishing in the Northern Bering Sea during this time. And then when you look now where these, these are the recoveries during the spawning season, you can kind of see that this slope area is pretty similar to what has been observed in her, in that previous plot. Now when you look at the summer 2020 recoveries, I just wanted to show that two out of three went back into the Northern Bering Sea. One stayed in the Southern Bering Sea, went to Bristol Bay. So this is kind of uh, the question about do fish return back north? Okay, so now what I'm gonna talk about is um, <clears throat> the other data that are recorded, not just the location, but the other data that are recorded as the tag, tag is on the fish. We record depth and temperature. So what we did was we looked at the maximum daily depths per fish, and then we also looked at the daily depth range, which means the maximum depth and the minimum depth and the difference between the two. And so we're basically saying if the maximum depth, for example, was 40 meters and the minimum depth was 20 meters, then the range for that day for that fish would be 20 meters. Does that make sense? So the fish moved up and down in the water column 20 meters. Okay, and so what we wanted to see is if there's any patterns of that over uh, the course of the year. And so what you can kind of see is 
that in the beginning of the year until December, the fish are around 50 meters, pretty steady, some a little shallower, some a little deeper, and their range in depth is not very big. It's around an average about five meters. And the temperatures were all over the place because the fish are in different areas um, that are warmer and colder. And then we have what we call that migration period, where you can see that the daily maximum depth gets um, deeper and deeper, and the depth range gets bigger and bigger. So they're not just moving deeper in the water, they're also moving more up and down in the water column. And the temperature, of course, is much lower because now you are in the winter. Um, <clears throat> what was interesting is that some of the fish were in really cold water, right around zero degrees. Okay, and then we have the spawning period in March, where you can see that the fish moved into, um, they were spawning between 50 and 150 meters, but a lot of them were on that, in that slope area. And then the range is really large and Part of that could be that they have some spawning behavior going on that makes them move in the water column a lot um, that have been, for example, described also for Atlantic cod. And then what was interesting to me was that the temperature was actually um, two degrees or higher. And uh, we have other scientists kind of looking at egg and larval survival and uh, were found that cod have actually quite a small tolerance for temperature for their larvae and the larvae need to be in waters between two and six degrees. And so that was really interesting to me is that these fish kind of moved into that warmer water during spawning. And then you have again a migration period where the fish again move into much more shallower waters and then um, a foraging period which is happening right now. Okay. So when you look at the monthly mean depth range and the monthly mean maximum depth, you can kind of see this trend even more pronounced that in the beginning, this is their like foraging period is pretty, um, the, the depth range is around five meters at 50 meters depth. And then they go slowly into deeper and deeper waters until spawning. And then during the foraging time and their migration back out of it, they go back to a much more uh, lower depth range and a shallower depth. So what can you do, what else can you do with this data? So one of the things that we are going to do is actually look at what's called individual travel paths by looking at geolocation model. And so what, what, what you do is you use the light depth and temperature data and you incorporate them into a model and then um, a hidden Markov model will actually predict the movement path over time for each individual fish. Julie Nielsen um, is the person that has been doing this model and here is her first hot off the press um, fish that we did and it's pretty amazing. So this is one of the fish that was tagged at St. Lawrence and ended up in Bristol Bay in June. And what she did was she calculated the um, 99% probability that the fish in a certain area, which is in the gray, so all the gray areas includes the 99% probability, and then the colors include the 50% daily probability. And then she basically added up all these probabilities by months to come up with um, a polygon for that month. And you can really see this really nice progression. Here is what is kind of the feeding, migration, and then the pink is the spawning time. And you can see that this fish was in this area, which is also a canyon um, during spawning. And then it moved into this Bristol Bay area to feed in the summer. So this is kind of the cream of the crop, so to say. If we have really good data coming back from our satellite tag, we can do this for every single fish and really predict where there were in space and time, which is pretty, pretty amazing. Okay, so this is um, to summarize what we've discussed. Let's see, do we have another poll coming up? Yeah, almost. So to summarize what, what, what I just said, first of all, 
COD can be tagged with pop-up satellite tags, which is really um, something that we learned over the last couple of years. Even though they have swim bladders, they can be um, treated nicely and survive well. <clears throat> and it's really essential for this work to work together with our cooperative research partners. And it's really um, nice to see that we can tag on all different fishing platforms. <clears throat> Satellite tags can provide the movement path and critical biological information um, on habitat use and temperature preference. And this information can be gathered independent of fishing efforts. So that's what's really neat if you work in a remote area. Satellite tags can pop up and all you need to do is put it on the fish. You don't have to ever touch the fish again to get the data back. <clears throat> so going back to, I don't know if you recall, we had these five research questions and um, here is the answers to those research questions. Um, what is the movement between northern and southern Bering Sea cod? Well, from September to December, they actually stayed in the northern Bering Sea. Nine fish stayed in the northern Bering Sea and three went into Russian waters. But and from January to March, they moved south into the southern Bering Sea. Uh, one fish moved all the way to the Gulf of Alaska and three fish stayed in Russian waters. So should I stay or should I go? Should they go back to the northern Bering Sea? Well, June to July, one fish stayed in the southern Bering Sea and went to Bristol Bay and two fish moved to the northern Bering Sea. We'll have four more fish pop up in August, so we can't wait to see what they are doing. And the second research question was, what is the movement of cod between the US and Russian border? Six out of 30 tags were recovered in Russian waters, three in September to December, three from January to March, but none of them in June or July. So yes, there's definitely movement between US and Russian border. Um, I think we need a little bit more data to see how consistent that is and if fish maybe move back or not uh, into uh, Alaskan waters after they were in Russia. So do cod stay under the ice in the winter in the northern Bering Sea? So we actually had one tag recovered under ice. This fish most likely died in January under the ice, but the tag popped up close to the Bering Strait. We don't think the fish actually went all the way there. We think the tag was moved there by the ice most likely or currents. So that brings up to poll question number four or three? Three. Have you ever seen or hooked a Pacific cod when fishing under the sea ice? So the answers are yes, no, and I don't fish under the ice. Again, sorry for those of you on the telephone. Um, and we'll give people time to vote. Ooh, a lot of non-fishers on this particular call. Um, I would have to say, so I'm not allowed to vote the way this is set up. It won't let, give it to me because I'm launching these, but I would say, no, I've never seen or hooked a Pacific cod when fishing under the sea ice myself. I'm going to end the polling, share the results, and it looks like 83% of the people on this call don't fish under the ice, and the remainders, remainders have never seen a Pacific cod under the ice. All right. All right. I mean, we talked a lot about this. This was a big point of discussion. Do cod get under the ice? Do they get trapped under the ice? Do they die under the ice? Can they survive under the ice? So if anyone fishes, goes ice fishing and they catch a cod, I sure would like to know about it because that is really something we're, we're uh, interested in. Okay. Um, can cod spawn successfully in the northern Bering Sea? Well, we have had none of the fish spawn in the northern Bering Sea. Salmon fish spawn in the southern Bering Sea slope, two fish spawn in Russian waters, and um, one fish, I didn't put that in there, actually spawned in the Gulf of Alaska. So, so far, we have not seen that. And then the last question was, do cod return to the northern Bering Sea the following summer? Um, two fish actually returned to the Northern Bering Sea in June and July. It's a little early in the year to see if they go back to St. Lawrence Island area or not. 
but hopefully in August, those fish will tell us if they went all the way back up into that area. One fish, however, stayed in the Southern Bering Sea and went to Bristol Bay. Okay, so this was um, uh, all of the results and conclusions. Now for the future, what we wanna do is use that model the, um, to model the movement path over time with this geolocation model for all the Bering Sea fish that have enough data. So we come up with a really um, detailed um, knowledge on time and space of each fish exactly when they were during the entire time the tag was on them. Um, and then the other thing we can do is validate a Pacific Cod spawning habitat model that is done by other scientists with the tagging data that we have. So we can basically take our data and inform other models on a cod life history. Um, we also wanna re release more tags. And this year we were supposed to go up and release more tags uh, during our survey and with the Savunga fishermen. And of course COVID-19 happened and this is not gonna take place. However, our superheroes, Don and Myra and Jennifer, are going to release tags for us because they will go out in the field from Nome and they were so kind as to offer their help. So I'm very, very excited this is going to happen this year. We just sent them the tags, we sent them our buoys, and hopefully they can get some fish in the water for us this year. We're also thinking about maybe a tag release project in the Gulf of Alaska. We were hoping for winter 2021, but again, um, we don't know if that's gonna happen given the current COVID situation. And we just really want to continue our collaboration with all of our partners um, in the you know, Northern Bering Sea area. And um, it's been just a very exciting project for me to work with all of you and learn so much while we're doing it. And that is um, the end of our talk. So thank you very much, Suzanne. I don't know, we have two more poll questions. Do you want to use, have those out now or did you want to do the questions right off the bat? Um, maybe we should do questions first and then do the poll questions. All right, well, thank you so much. Suzanne, that was really interesting, and um, I am sure there are going to be some questions. Now, I know you have already a question in the chat box, and that was uh, from Molly and Vince. How frequently do the pop-up satellite tags record information? Daily, once a month, or a single data point when it pops up? That is a great question. Um, it depends on how we program the tags. So the, the tags that come up after 90 days will record depth and temperature and light, I want to say every five seconds. So many, many records per day. The tags that are out for 360 days, I want to say we're down to rec records every two hours, and then they're only for 12 hours per day, and you kind of... Um, go between day and night, I think you switch off. <clears throat> and that's all because there's only a limited amount of batteries on these tags and a li limited amount of data they can transmit. So you kind of have to, um, you kind of, when you program the tags, you have to play with that a little bit. And, and I notice you have Julie Nielsen in the chat box said, the satellite tags recorded data at daily intervals light-based latitude and longitude in eight-hour bins, temperature depth profiles, and time series data at 10-minute intervals. So she must have been involved in the tagging. <laughs> she is a master of the tags. Yes. And there's also another question. Can we get the data of the fish that pop up in August? And, and I know that in Nome, everyone, throughout the Bering Strait region, people are really interested in this question of where, what's happening with these Pacific cod. You know, our we, we no longer have our commercial crab season. People are trying to switch over to cod right now. Our processing plant is trying to do th that. So this is a big, there's a lot of things moving parts in the Bering Strait region right now. So if it's possible, maybe you could you either return 
uh, with a street science to kind of sum up your, are these the last four tags for this year that are waiting or will there be? They're the last four tags for this year and absolutely, I'm very happy to share that information. Um, I, you know, if there's interest, by all means, we, we are very happy to share that. Great, well, thank you. We'll follow up with that and I hope that answers your question, Chuck. Um, we'll get that information back to the, to the region. Anyone on the, any other questions? Chuck says, thank you very much, Su Suzanne. I know I have a question and, and that is for me, I don't know much about Pacific cod, I'm learning, but the spawning area for this fish looks to be on the shelf break where the, where the um, Northern Bering Sea sort of shallower waters all of a sudden fall off into the depths in the southern Bering Sea, that shelf break area. Um, you know, we do notice the, these cod have come, they've arrived to the region, they're probably having to swim further to get back to where they would like to be. Does anyone anticipate their spawning area moving north eventually? Or is that something that the fish are pretty stuck to that region? Respond. You know, Gay, that's, that's a really excellent question. I think I'm learning about all this. I, I think cod are a generalist. They are very, very adaptable. I would not be surprised if there is suitable spawning habitat that they will use it further north. But I'm not 100% clear on the requirements for their spawning habitat. I know that they really like a slope, they like it a little deeper, and they want a little bit of a current, but the eggs actually sink to the bottom. They're, they're slightly heavier, and they need to stay on the bottom undisturbed until um, they change their density. And I wanna say they go midwater to hatch. So it's quite complicated. They have a very specific requirement for the eggs. And so it needs to all match up for them to wanna spawn there. That's all I can say. So we're learning. <clears throat> and then any other questions for Suzanne? Oh, we've got one from Chad C. Oh, Chuck, yes, the slides will be available um, either both in this recording uh, at UAF Northwest Campus. Um, you'll be able to get the slides from me as well, her presentation. Suzanne was nice enough to provide it. Um, there is a question from Chad C. to everyone. On depth data, is there a way to determine where they are in the water table, i.e. depth relative to depth of the ocean? When depth data shows them to be in higher depths, is this because they are in shallower waters? Good question. Yeah, so Chad, we have actually looked at that quite a bit. And what, what we get back from a fish is the maximum depth and the minimum depth per day, and then sometimes you get a time series of depths per day. If you are in the Northern Bering Sea area where everything is 50 meters, if you're not at 50 meters, you're off the bottom. You know what I'm saying? So we're kind of thinking because the Bering Sea is so flat that the maximum depth is the bottom depth and everything less than that might be them being off bottom. And so that's what we've been kind of doing when we, when we talk about range. The range is really just the maximum depth minus the minimum depth of that day. And so we're thinking that's how the fish move. Yes, they do move off bottom. And I think we can assume that it's a pretty fair assumption. And you can say something about their, their daily um, occurrence in the water column, for sure. And I think when they, when they go off into deeper waters, I mean, that's a good question. How, how steep is that slope? And can they move up and down that slope within a day and cover that depth range? I think we would, we would have to go really micro, look at this in very specific detail where we think they are and see if, if they could do that. I think they actually move up and down a bit when they travel. Because the fish in the Aleutians did that as well. When they traveled, they had a lot more up and down movement. I don't know if they ride currents more or a tidal or what they're doing, but they do that when they travel, so. <clears throat> All right, any other questions for Suzanne? We still have two d different polls. And um, why don't I launch one of those right now? Let's do it. 
and that is sort of the changing abundance. The number of Pacific cod have really increased in the Bering Strait region. I am concerned, excited, wish they'd return to the Southern Bering Sea, or not interested. People are sending in their answers. And we will shut her down. Three, two, one. And here are the results. For those of you on the phone, the big winner was, wish they'd return to the Southern Bering Sea. So that was 50%, followed by concerned, followed by excitement. Everybody's interested in the fate of the Pacific Cod. So I will stop that. And we have one other question. I'll do it now. Last question. Do you think the Pacific Cod will continue moving north into the Chukchi Sea? Yes, no, hadn't thought of that. Ooh, okay. People were quite quick to respond to this one. I'm going to end it. Three, two, one. All right. And the results are yes, that is interesting. Do you think the Pacific Cod will continue moving north? Yes, 64%. Only 18% um, said no or hadn't thought of that. So that is, that's interesting. I think we're all seeing a trend, that's for sure. Um, all right, well, I can't wait to um, come up with that result and share it at a straight friends talk. Well, th well, thank you again. There is a note from Julie Nielsen says the tags deployed for 90 days or less have acceleration data that could help us answer this question better too, Chad. I don't know if you saw that response to you in the chat box. Okay. And with that, if there's no other questions, no other questions, I better get back on. If you can hit stop share, uh, Suzanne, maybe we can I see. I have a question. Oh, excellent. Hit this, the stop share button on, on your end yeah. and we can probably see you. Some people can see you a little better now. Um, and there's a caller on the line that has a question for you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, is there any holes in the trick you see that the uh, cod could spawn in? Good question. Are there any holes, sort of deep areas that the Pacific cod could spawn in? in this region, in the northern Bering Sea? And then, you know, I think there might be an area um, going towards Russia that they like to go to. I would have to look, I mean, I was very surprised that they all went into this quite deeper water to spawn. I was not expecting that. Um, so now I think what we need to do is look in much more detail at the northern Bering Sea depth contour and see, you know, what is available there. I, so it is I, a possibility. I would have to look, yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, so it is a possibility that there is deep enough water, perhaps on the Russian side, that they might be I, Yes, I know, like on the Russian side, it gets a little deeper, um, but I would have to look to see if there's anything, if there's any contours in the Northern Bering Sea that might be interesting for them to spawn as well. I, I really think they don't like to spawn under ice. You know, if there is ice, I think that would be a problem. But if there is no ice, would they spawn in shallower water potentially? I don't know. I mean, that's something we just have to kind of see what happens. You know, right. yeah. Quick, quick question from me. You know, we're talking about up here when you're in the Bering Street region, the border is right there all the time. And we share the resources in the ocean every day. And, and we share the concerns on either side. If you're a resident up here, right, we, we share the weather and, and um, how we utilize things that in the sea. Uh, are these informations that you're, is this information that you're gathering here shared quickly with the Russians, with the Russian side, the Russian scientists, biologists, people? You mean this information about our COD study? Yeah. I don't know who I could share it with on the Russian side. I would welcome if, to hear. If, K, if, if KNOM is here, it's probably be on the radio. 
so okay. they might hear it that way. But but it's something to think about. Um, for sure, you. for sure. Yes, yeah. that would be very interesting. Um, People would be interested, I'm sure, to know how the results of the fish are from here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Gay, you can be the the channel to connect all these dots because you know how to do that. Well, well thanks. Um, all right. Any other questions for Suzanne? Any other thank you for the caller who called in? Um, with that, I know we, I don't know how to, how we sign off in Zoom now and thank you, but, but thank you for a great presentation.